Hello and welcome to SAR Histories, where in this video we will be returning to the unstately home, Cork Abbey. During my last visit to Cork Abbey, there was a lot still closed due to the pandemic, such as the entire second floor. But this year, more is open, with many objects on display. Cork Abbey is a place with a long and varied history. It has been the site of a religious settlement, agricultural farmland and industrial activity as well as a family home. People first came to live at Cork in the 12th century as part of a small religious community. It is believed that Augustian canons were attracted to the area because of its saluted forest and good water supply. After the dissolution of the monasteries in the mid-16th century, the land changed hands several times before the first house was built here in the 1570s. Since Henry Harper bought Cork in 1622, a member of the Harper family lived here until 1991. At first sight the mansion appears to be an 18th century house, but closer inspection reveals that it incorporates earlier buildings. The present mansion was built for Sir John Harper in 1702 by an unknown architect. In plan form it is roughly square with a central courtyard and rectangular pavilions to each of the corners. Evidence suggests that in 1702, Sir John Harper intended to smarten the house with a new single wing, though it seems his plan must have changed. He demolished the north wing, but retained the remodelled the east and west wings, introducing new windows. The first major overhaul of the interiors was undertaken by Sir Henry, 7th Baronet. He redecorated a suite of rooms for his own use on the second floor, overlooking his landscaping works to the east, and created a study in the southeast corner of the house on the ground floor. Further changes and updates were made by later generations, including the panelling in the saloon installed for Sir John. Most of these rooms on the first floor I have covered in my last video, which I highly recommend you watch, but now I am able to take you up onto the second floor. For visitors walking through the rooms, it may seem that very little work has been done, but this is far from the truth. What Cork has become is an alternative way of approaching the conservation and preservation of an historic estate. Rather than tasking conservators with restoring the objects and interiors to the former glory, Cork has developed its own philosophy of repair but not restore. A lot of time and expense has been spent painstakingly conserving the building, objects and interiors so that they were structurally sound but looking as they did when first found. This unusual approach required new and pioneering conservation methods, making cork a crucible of scientific invention. 
The removal of the wallpaper required the development of a unique process involving enzymes to soften the old glue. This later enabled the paper's reinstatement, uncleaned and apparently untouched. The collections are one of the most astonishing features of Corp. The variety and volume of the family's belongings are extraordinary. However, it is their completeness reflecting the minute detail of Victorian life which sets them apart. It is fortunate that the collection passed generation to generation with very little sold or thrown away. Much of the accumulation was gradual. However, in some areas, it was the result of concentrated and specialist collecting. The kitchen, like the rest of the house, was repaired but not restored. For the piles of metal found here, methods were researched for treating rusting surfaces, arresting the decaying process but maintaining its appearance. During the campaign to save Cork, the kitchen became a symbol for the estate's romantic decay. Largely unused since Sir Vaunce's death, its central table was piled with rusting tools. Below stairs, the servants' rooms, including the scullery, lamp room, wash house and laundry, lay abandoned. Character references were essential for a servant to be able to obtain work. At court, there are hundreds of these, revealing where servants work before call, their suitability for the post and the unpredictability of servants' lives. Their previous employer could be generous or wholly honest. All servants were expected to conform to the strict moral codes of the period. Harriet Phillips, a housekeeper of 15 years from 1865, could not reveal that she had an illegitimate child before she came to Cork. It is unlikely that she was able to share the joy of becoming a grandmother with anyone else. Male and female servants were not encouraged to fraternise. However, at least two known couples met at Cork. William Sutton, a butler who married Mary Dean, a housemaid, while Amy Wakelin, a laundry maid, married Charles Wood, a gardener. The usual way to leave the house is via an underground tunnel, provided in the early 19th century for the movement of beer barrels from the brew house in the stables to the cellar. The brick tunnel sustains an almost flat arch for 300 yards from the courtyard to the brew house, which still has its great vats and tubs, ovens and coppers. Although there have been stables on this site since Tudor times, the current brick building was built between 1712 and 1716, designed by the Burton-on-Trent architect William Gygs.
When they were in use, the stables provided accommodation for riding and carriage horses on the ground floor, with the upper floors reserved for grooms and coachmen. Today, many of the rooms are open and house carts and equipment from the Victorian era. The east side of the block was where tack was cleaned and dried, and where the grooms' mess rooms was located. In the central yard there is a mounting block for family members to swiftly climb upon their horses. The yard was also used to bring out the carriages and attach them to harnessed horses. Immediately behind the main stable block is another outer yard known as the Smithy Yard. It was built as an extension to the stables in the early 19th century, with the range of loose boxes on the right hand side added by Sir Henry, 7th Baronet, in 1804. Other activities that went on in the smithy yard included blacksmithing and shoeing horses as well as collecting manure that was used as fertiliser on the estate. The carriage collection is a rare and important survival. The majority of stable blocks on country house estates have been reused and the carriages no longer remain. There are 12 carriages at Cork, housed in the place where they would have been used. Most still have their original paintwork, fixtures and fittings. The church of St Giles stands on the hill opposite the south front of the house. It dates from 1827 and is a remodelling of an earlier building undertaken by Sir George. The simple nave and chancel reflects the form of the earlier church. The tower over the west entrance is a striking addition. It has been suggested that the fabric of a medieval building is buried within St Giles, but there seems to be no evidence for this. All evidence points to an Elizabethan building preceding the current one, probably erected by Richard Wensley between 1575 and 1585. Behind the orangery is a series of rooms, including the gardener's boffy, complete with seat drawers, the head gardener's office, a pony shed and several stove houses. The stove houses heated the orangery and glass houses to a constant temperature. A stove house containing a rare cockle stove heated the apple store. The walk leading to the boffy was the gardener's working yard, a practical space with ashes from the boilers used for the path.
The gardens at Cork Abbey are deeply romantic. The abundance of colour in the flower garden, the productive beds of vegetables, soft fruits and cut flowers, and lush tender exotic contrasts with signs of decay in the buildings. The garden had a functional purpose to feed the household at Cork, but it was also a place of resort for the family and their friends. Cork Abbey is the house where time stood still, but for many years the estate has welcomed an increasing number of visitors through its gates. While many want to experience the country house in decline, others come to explore the over 600 acres of inspiring historic parkland. If you have enjoyed this video then get yourself to Cork Abbey where you can help keep history alive. So until next time, goodbye.